business. You know, they were coming all along of the coast, coming here for fish, smoking the fish, dyeing the fish, and going into the villages and uh, selling the fish. So when the Portuguese came the first time on this island of Goi, they found some African people, some fishermen. You know, the Portuguese start spread of slavery, and they also start collaboration with the fishermen. Anna Fai and her husband own the St. Germain restaurant on Gorey Island. Her family settled here centuries ago. The account of her ancestors' collaboration with the slavers is not unusual because Africans were accustomed to an internal slave trade, one in which slaves were often a part of the family. However, during the era of the Atlantic slave trade, human bondage took on a new connotation. The domestic slavery that existed in Africa was an internal African slavery, just as there was domestic slavery in Rome, classical Greece, and, and Slavic countries. The slave trade across the Sahara was on a small scale due to the difficulties in transportation. And this form of slavery does not have the same meaning as the Atlantic slave trade that lasted for about four to five centuries and whose economic benefits were totally different. When speaking of slavery, one must consider that the institution lasted 500 years. The Atlantic slave trade went through three phases, slaving by piracy, by warlike alliance, and finally, by peaceful partnership. So what, what Europeans would see when they arrived in West Africa is what they thought was what they would come to call, in fact, a reservoir of slavery. And over the years, they would create this mythology that all they did was tap in to an already existing pool of slavery in West Africa. But what they really were encountering was the intricate West African kinship network structures where, um, where uh, for protection very often, a uh, West African, indeed a whole family, would seek dependence on a particular chieftain or king um, or ruler. The Portuguese, they come and they start a collaboration by giving them alcohol, you know, some wine, some spices, some guns, some salt, uh, something like that, and they start. And these people also who didn't believe into anything, they start a collaboration with them. They ask them to go into the village and to bring them people. But when they ask them to bring them people, they didn't tell them that they are going to make a trade of slavery. Some refused, some of our ancestors refused, but some they still were making collaboration with them. So it was a way to get rich. Not only did the fishermen collaborate, it was in the interest of the captured young slave girls to have sex with the slavers, because if they were found pregnant, they would be set free to bear the mulatto child of the master. As time went by, the mulatto daughters of the European soldiers and traders became very wealthy. They were able to own property. Unfortunately, the mulatto men did not fare as well as their female counterparts, but both received educational benefits from exposure to European culture. The women were called Sinyaos. Today, the history of the Sinyaos is kept alive by the women of Gore, who dress in traditional long gowns of rich brocades made from colorful imported fabric of different textures. Known for their reputation of being tall, stately, and beautiful, the Sinyaos also wore bright cotton headdresses tied in a triangular sugarloaf style. Quantities of gold jewelry adorn their bodies, completing an impressive picture. Over the centuries, the island of Gore was controlled by the Portuguese, Dutch, British, and French. The eclectic population made up of a variety of African ethnic groups, whites and mulattoes, made Gore perhaps one of the most interesting places in this region. Now, most of the houses around the waterfront were controlled by slave traders, but La Maison des Esclaves is perhaps one of the most interesting because it is here that Africans encountered the door of no return. After a riot, the slave was hanged by his abdomen instead of his neck in order that the agony last longer. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the slave trade was one of the biggest genocides humanity has ever experienced. Joseph Njai has been the curator of this museum for more than 20 years. Six days a week, he explains the intricacies of the slave trade to tourists from around the world. 
L'effectif dans cette maison... Le nombre de dans cette maison peut varier de 150 à 200, including men, women et children. Les slaves used to wait ici pour almost 3 to 3 and a half months because they were convoyed on sailboats. Within a family, the father, the mother, and the child were in different cells. And since the destination also depended on the buyer, the father being sent to Louisiana, the mother to Brazil or Cuba, and the child to Haiti or the West Indies, the separation was then complete. Mr. Njai says Africans left Gore under registration numbers instead of their African names. Even today, a haunting feeling embraces all of those who walk through the dark dungeons of the slave house. There you can see a reconstruction of the chain these poor souls had around their ankles when they had to relieve themselves. To the left and to the right, there was a pin riveted to the chain, and in the middle a very heavy ball the slaves had to carry with his hands between his legs when he went to relieve himself outside. It is reported that over a 300-year period, more than 15 to 20 million captured Africans passed through the slave houses here on Gore. The question must be asked, where did these people come from? And how did their fate lead them into bondage? Most of the slaves were from West and Central Africa. They were taken from a score of principal market zones that ran on a 3,000-mile coastline from Senegal in the north to Angola in the south, the Mandinka of the Guinea coast, the Nupe from Central Nigeria, the Yorba of Western Nigeria, the Tukalor of Senegal, and the numerous Fulani that lived along the waterways of the Gambia River. They were all a part of the hideous trade. The Gambia, one of Africa's smallest nations, is sandwiched in the middle of Senegal. It has been documented that the Gambia provided a direct source of slaves to the southern region of the United States. Dr. Suleiman Yang. First time I went there, I saw many uh, young ladies and uh, young men who really looked like people I left back home in the Gambia. And of course, as I did more research, it became apparent to me that uh, many Gambians, in quotation marks, Gambians, people who originally came from that part of the world we now call Gambia, were brought to South Carolina. And of course, the family resemblance of some of those people uh, betrayed their Senegambian ancestry. The Gambia is truly a majestic river. It's 1,000 miles long, and today is traveled by pirogues like this, carrying tourists and goods to the villages along the banks of the river. The Gambia empties into the Atlantic Ocean, and during the height of the slave trade, the annual exports from the river were estimated at 1,000 slaves, 15 tons of wax and ivory, 10,000 hides, and a good supply of redwood for the English clothiers and dyers. The effects of the slave trade are still being felt here in the village of Jupere. Author Alex Haley's search for his roots led him to this village several years ago. The story exposed some of the festering wounds of the trade, but it also brought world attention to this traditional African village. The story of Kunta Kente will undoubtedly be passed on to the newest member of the Kente clan, also named Kunta. Little Kunta's father, Mr. Kente, recounts the legacy of his family. When I was considerably young, I remember working with my father on the farm. He told me about Kunta Kente. I cannot guarantee if Kunta Kente is actually related to Alex Haley, but as far as I know, Kunta Kente was a family member, and he was taken to America because of the Atlantic slave trade. During that time, a lot of people were taken. Kunta Kente was one of the most popular because he was seen as one of the successors. Many young people uh, were apprehended uh, or ab abducted, like the case of Kunta Kinte. You, know, you go to the woods to get wood for your family, or you were sent to do some chores. And then, of course, some of these marauding uh, agents of uh, slavers would apprehend you. And of course, there were cases where you have direct African involvement. The 124-year-old griot of the village of Jufere says he remembers the oral history passed down to him of the time when whites first came to their village. That was before colonialism, big kings and big villages have waged wars against small kings and smaller villages, bombard them or whatever to stop them from taking the strong men and women of the villages in exchange for rum and tobacco. 
we are still feeling the pain because of, well, most of our strong men were taken. We're still lamenting over it. What do we remind them of? What do they think about when they see us? We are filled with joy when we meet you. When you see James Island, you know that slaves were a part of that. Fort James, named after James I of England, uh, was established in the 17th century by the British. And they were able to use that to control access to the Gambia River because at that particular time in the history of the world, there was much belief that uh, the River Gambia would lead to the gold mines of Africa, which was the attraction for many of these European countries to Africa in the first place. The slavers took advantage of and promoted warfare among the different ethnic groups, thus making it easier to obtain captives. At that time, smuggling slaves was very common, so no one can be certain about the numbers of Africans that were exported or the numbers that survived, because the slavers withheld information from their logs. But it has long been speculated that as many as 100 million left Africa, with 10 million surviving landing in the Americas, the Atlantic Islands, and Europe. Passage was notorious for the number of deaths that occurred. Packed like sardines on the slave ships, the death tolls averaged 15 to 20 percent. The slaves were packed so tightly on ship they could neither lie full length or sit upright. By the middle of the 18th century, a serious uh, business argument ensued over the so-called loose packing and tight packing techniques. Uh, Simply put, the, the argument was if you put 200 slaves in a ship um, and you gave them some space as human beings to move, uh, would, the, would the mortality rate uh, be such that you'd get more successfully landed in the new world? Or if you put 400 in the ship and indeed stack them, uh, tight pack them as it was called, would you get a greater return? Over time and experimentation with this, this hideous system, uh, they found that tight packing got a greater return. Despite deplorable conditions aboard the ships, the slaves were still not docile. Revolts were incessant, and fear of the cargo bred savage cruelty from the crew. It was not uncommon for a captain to kill a slave, cut up the heart, liver, and intestines into minute pieces, and force each slave to eat his fellow man, threatening those who refused with the same torture. We were taken in a boat from place to place and sold every place we stopped at. In about six months, we got a ship in which we first saw white people. They were French. They bought us. We found here a great many other slaves. There were about 80, including women and children. The Frenchmen sent away all but five of us into another very large ship. We five stayed on board till we got to England, which was about five or six months. The slaves we saw on board the ship were chained together by the legs below deck, so close they could not move. They were flogged very cruelly. I saw one of them flogged till he died. We could not tell what for. They gave him enough to eat. The place they were confined in below deck was so hot and nasty. I could not bear to be in it. A great many of the slaves were ill, but they were not attended to. They used to flog me very bad on board the ship. The captain cut my head very bad. Slave buyers preferred their victims between the ages of 14 to 35, and the most prized were in their early 20s. The sex ratio was two men to every woman. Europeans accepted younger children, but very rarely older persons. They shipped the most healthy wherever possible. Well, the conditions uh, uh, were, were horrible. Um, uh, Vincent Harding, in his book, There is a River, uses the phrase, he calls the slave ships the the cramped and fetid waiting rooms of history. 
uh, eyewitness accounts abound of, of how you could smell a slave ship five miles downwind if the wind was right. Again, sir. I'm glad to see you in town Here in sir. Colonial Williamsburg, uh, the 20th century here, meets the 18th century. Oh, On this 173-acre living museum, I character interpreters slaves, portray the men who participated in the slave trade. 100 choice Angola slaves, although they've only just performed quarantine, I would be rather skeptical as to purchasing any Angola slaves presently. Uh, what disease, sir? What disease? Mm -hmm. Smallpox, I believe. Smallpox. I don't really That's a dangerous one, sir. That's one of the hazards of the slave trade. You know, what is that? Too? Disease, uh, loss of, of cargo. The very first slave ships that came to English America, to the English colonies, landed approximately seven miles from where we are standing in Jamestown, Virginia. And that would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 20, 20 slaves. Uh, 20 individuals who were not legally classified as slaves because there was no statutory recognition of slavery in Virginia at that time. Uh, but they were people of African descent. Robert Watson is assistant director of the Colonial Williamsburg African American Educational Outreach Program. This replica of the original slave quarters on Carter's Grove Plantation in Williamsburg, Virginia is the only one of its kind in the world. There are records that were kept uh, by the, the Carter Burroughs family on the, the, the people who lived here. Um, we know who they were by name. We were able to uh, name at least uh, some of the people who lived here. Uh, we know that there were families. We know that there were extended families. And we know that there were people who lived here who were not necessarily blood related but were part of the extended family concept my baby girl was born just before Christmas <laughs> something at last it was in my heart. I named her Mary after my mama dark like my mama I sort of thought she looked like my mama too oh she growed real I took her to the field on my back. <laughs> she was the only thing in all this world that was really mine. Well, after a while, she was too big to carry to the field. So I had to leave her with my old Aunt Daisy along with the other little ones. I carried her to sleep to our cabin after sundown and curled up around at night, loving her so hard and fearing so terrible. And then one day they come and took her sold her to the slave trader. <laughs> I can't talk about it. Not even now. My Mary. <laughs> they took her. Well, slavery was definitely an economic institution, but it was also a social institution. But from an economic perspective, Virginia was, was, was at the forefront of, uh, of, the, of the institution of slavery. Uh, you will find that when you go uh, throughout the state of Virginia that slaves mm -hmm. on the plantations were the basis of, of the labor system. Uh, Williamsburg and, and this particular area, the Chesapeake Bay area, uh, typified uh, the economic uh, value of the slavery. The only thing we could, we could draw the comparison to today, I suppose, are the greatest corporations, uh, the multi-billion dollar uh, multinational corporations of today would be in some ways equivalent to the largest of the slave ship companies of the 17th and 18th centuries. Slavery was indeed valuable during the height of the trade. 
profits were estimated in the millions, affording plantation owners the luxury of high living, like the Carter family who built this country home in 1755. The trade also began to take on new dimensions. A new crop, cotton, became king, especially since the slaves had agricultural skills and were extremely gifted in harvesting this crop. This skill, of course, emanated from centuries of working with cotton in Africa. Thus, years of free labor catapulted America and Europe into the industrial age with high profits and low overhead. After suffering a severe whipping, I was shut up under orders and the threat of a severe punishment for anyone who might even give me even a drop of water. What I suffered there afflicted with hunger and well I know it, tormented with fear in such a deep and isolated place, separated from the house in a backyard next to a stable and a pestilent, foul-smelling trash heap, alongside a wet, infested, and noxious outhouse which was only separated by a wall full of holes, a den for huge rats that walked over me without even stopping. So afraid was everyone in the house that absolutely no one dared, even if they had the opportunity give me even a bite. My head was full of stories about evil things from long ago, of apparitions from beyond the grave, and of spells cast by the dead so that when a troop of rats rushed out making a lot of noise, I imagined the cave was full of ghosts and cried out, asking for pity. so many lashes that I couldn't take any more. And they shut me up again, keeping the key in my mistress's own room. It's hot, soothing, lemony, strong. pain, the anguish, the rebellion, and miscegenation. They all describe a business that over time changed the face of the world and provided an economic head start for Europe, the Americas, and the West Indies. But what did depopulation mean for Africa? How can one possibly measure the cultural or social impact on family structure and institutional development on the continuity of education on the continuity of language? Um, how can we ever measure the kinds of uh, cultural and social and human impact that the slave trade had? Part of the impact can be seen in the separation of Senegal and the Gambia. At one time, there was little distinction between these two countries, but with Europe's voracious appetite to gobble up these prime African territories, ensuing wars left Senegal in the hands of the French and the Gambia with the British. Most of the people here are from the same ethnic groups, and even today they are trilingual. U.S. Ambassador to Senegal, George E. Moose. The fact that they are now separate entities with their own governments and their own institutions is indeed a legacy of, of colonialism. It creates certain obstacles to regional economic development, and there's no question about that. And I think that uh, if one looks to what must be done in order to, to try to, to create the conditions for economic growth, one has to deal with the, with the issue of how does one uh, bring, um, in this case, a Senegal and a Gambia more closely and cooperatively together. George E. Moose is the fourth African-American U.S. ambassador to Senegal. Diplomatic relations with Senegal began in 1960. So the idea of African-Americans going back to Senegambia to discover their heritage is not new. Abubakar Africa Weaver, formerly Clifford Weaver of Roxbury, Massachusetts, came to Senegal 12 years ago on an NAACP tour and has remained ever since. As soon as I arrived here, like everybody else, we fell in love with the, 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 you know, the color, the beauty, you know, the terrain of the land, the music, the language, and the warmness of the people. 
And some said to me, oh man, this is where I should be. Along with adopting Senegal as his home, Abu has also embraced the Islamic religion, which has been intricately woven into the fabric of much of West African culture for centuries. Maloud ceremony celebrates the birth of the Prophet Muhammad, founder of Islam, which has been the dominant religion in a large portion of West Africa since the 11th century. It too played a role in the Atlantic slave trade. Dr. Barry claims that Islam represents everything that is good and bad about West Africa. The idea was that kings were not made to make their subjects slaves, but to keep them away from slavery. Islam was never against slavery as such. The first reaction of Islam against slavery was not against slavery itself, but against the Atlantic slave trade. There is a difference. Perhaps that is why the Moors of Mauritania, many of whom are descendants of Arabs, did not legally abolish slavery until 1980, something that is still causing a problem today. The conflict in Senegal Mauritania is a conflict the conflicts between the blacks and the Mauritanians is extremely complex with many dimensions. One such problem of long duration is the conflict imposed by the nomads upon the indigenous population of the Senegal River Valley. The nomads being the Moors or the white race and the indigenous black population of the Senegal River Valley. The conflict had to be exacerbated by the fact that the Moors could not be taken as slaves. On the contrary, they came into the valley of Senegal on the one hand to obtain slaves for their own production within Mauritania and at the same time to sell slaves in the Atlantic slave trade. Despite the political difficulties between the Mauritanians and Senegalese, religion is the one factor that remains a common thread. Here in the town of Kalak, one of the major leaders in the region, Imam Hassan Sisse, gathers his flock for prayer five times a day, as is the Muslim tradition. His followers include a group of Americans who have come here not only to study, but to get in touch with their heritage. I wanted my daughter to learn Quran. And I wanted her to love the religion without having any problems, without feeling different. I don't see what she has missed. She has, she's missed the drug culture, which I didn't want her to get involved in anyway. Just as Karima Abdul Karim is trying to save her children from the evils of modern time, female slaves would go to great lengths to save their children from the auction block. One early morning at harvest time, my Frederick was born, big baby, fat, pretty as could be, friendly and happy almost from the beginning. And I know that there wasn't nothing I wouldn't do to keep my child. And I know that when he got big enough, Massa would just as soon sell him as not. The answer came to me in the dead of the night, just like a voice of Jesus. If the child was crippled, wouldn't nobody buy him. I looked down on my little baby, perfect and strong, and I knowed what I had to do. It was a dreadful thing to think on. But the memory of them selling my Mary and my Benji and my Jane gives me strength so that the next Sunday I carried my baby into the woods. I took along an old meat cleaver. I was trembling so bad most couldn't do it, but I kept hearing the cries of my other babies when they was torn from me to be sold, kept seeing their faces all twisted up and their eyes, oh, I ran! 
raised that cleaver and prayed to the Lord it would give me strength not to miss. And I swung my braid down through the foot, down into the ground. That sound echoes in my head always, and the awful sound of my little baby's cries. And child, the sight of that poor little foot cut clean off all but the heel and ankle. I'll carry that memory with me to my grave. But it worked. NASA couldn't sell Frederick. Gambian descendants like Anna Fai, curator Mr. Njai, and the Kentes of the Gambia all share the deep feeling of what it means to be a symbol of a painful history that involves deportation, exile, slavery, oppression, but above all, survival, as revealed by slaves who finally won yeah. their freedom. Sir, I am happy to inform you that you are not mistaken in the man whom you sold as property and received pay for as much such. But I thank God that I am not property now. You may perhaps think hard of us running away from slavery, but as to myself, I have but one apology to make for it, which is this. I have only to regret that I did not start at an earlier period. I might have been free long before I was, but you had it in your power to have kept me there much longer than you did. I think it is very probable that I should have been a toiling slave on your plantation today if you had treated me differently. Although it was by no means exclusively a moral crusade, people like Wilberforce in England uh, and certain uh, of the great libertarians in the French Revolution were quite serious in their belief that slavery and the slave trade were immoral and had to be destroyed. For six months I tried to make my escape. I used to rise at four o'clock in the morning to find somebody to assist me. And at last, I succeeded. On Sunday evening, I begged leave to attend church, which was reluctantly granted if I completed all my work, which was no easy task. It appeared as if my mistress used every possible exertion to delay me from church. Extensive hoops were then worn, and as I had attached my whole wardrobe under mine at a, by a cord around my waist, it required considerable dexterity and no small amount of maneuvering to hide the fact from my mistress. I endeavored to conceal my own excitement by backing and edging very gently out the door. Now, there was a company of soldiers about to take passage across the ferry, and I followed. I showed my pass and proceeded up the stairs. I seated myself in a remote corner of the boat. And in a few moments, I... By 1888, the formal abolition of slavery had taken place in most parts of the world. Colonialism, segregation, and institutionalized racism would persist for the next 100 years, with the remnants still being felt today. But the millions of slaves that were lost and journeyed through the dark passages should never be forgotten. To make certain, a monument is being planned to memorialize the tortured souls that were stolen from their motherland. Dr. Adama Diallo, special advisor to the president of Senegal. L'idée de lancer un memorial pour regrouper 
Belong the idea like of creating a memorial to bring back together all the people from the diaspora was put forward after coming up with the idea of the Black Art Festival. That is where the idea of a memorial came from. Since then, the African heads of state met within the OAU in 1986 to try to support the memorial. A resolution drawn up by the OAU heads of state was approved by a vote in 1986 with the help of the president of Senegal, who endorsed it. Les Amadis was chosen as the actual site where the monument will be placed because it marks the closest point between the old world and the Americas. In practice, the first location would be over here, the second one over there behind me, and the third one by the lighthouse over there. By the lighthouse is the highest elevation, 170 meters, whereas the maximum elevation on land is 41 meters. Back in the United States, West African countries have come together with African Americans to launch a worldwide competition for the designing of the Gore Almadiz Memorial. Minister of Culture of Senegal, Mustafa Ka. The initiative came from a group of African intellectuals and intellectuals of African descent who belong to the International Association of FESPAC as well as uh, the President of Senegal himself, President Abdou Diouf. As we should never forget the Nazi Holocaust, we should never forget the slave trade. As we should never forget, you know, Auschwitz, we should never forget Gouray Island. Uh, as we should never forget um, the trenches along the Somme in 1916, we should never forget those scenes on the docks in Barbados or in Jamestown or in Boston or any other place in the New World where wrecks of human beings uh, riddled with scurvy were taken off ships and commodified and sold. it would be appropriate to conclude this program here in Jamestown, Virginia, along the shores where the first captured African set foot on American soil in 1619. We can always ponder the question, what if slavery had never happened? How different would the world be today? When we consider the contributions Africans have made in music, sports, arts, medicine, politics, and human rights, we begin to understand why the descendants of Africans throughout the diaspora have earned the right to be honored in history. The proposed Gore Almaday's memorial is one way of paying homage to the millions of Africans who were taken from their homeland in the largest forced migration in world history. Another is to make sure that generations to come always remember the tremendous sacrifices of those who traveled the dark passages. I'm Tanya Hart. Thank you for watching. Airline accommodations made possible by Air Afrique, the airline that brings you safely to the exotic gateways of Africa. Hotel accommodations provided by the Sabana Pullman Hotel in Dakar, Senegal, a luxury hotel situated on its own peninsula on the Atlantic coast of Africa, a secluded resort located only minutes away from the heart of the capital. For reservations and information, call 1-800-223-9862 or write Pullman Hotels, 200 West 57th Street, Suite 706, New York, New York, 10019. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry.